uh, doing a, a treatment of transport. So, um, the chemical reactions. This, these are just, this is just an overview of the kind of things that we'll be interested in. I guess reactions in in a general sense. Um, and the way I view it, we've got uh, two types of reactions that we'll be interested in, uh, chemical and, and biological. Uh, here's a little shot of chemical reactions. So we've got something going on and producing, uh, I don't know, that brown stuff there. Uh, one of the things we'll need to, uh, to, to be able to characterize uh, for all of these reactions is the um, with just kind of the basic units. <coughs> so for chemical reactions, uh, what we're interested in is the concentration of some chemical species, and there are a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, the, the mass of the species per volume, uh, usually of a fluid, so mass per volume of, of, uh, of, of water, say. Um, concentrations in soils, uh, are done typically as a mass of, uh, of a compound per mass of soil, so on a, a mass ratio. Another way of doing it is uh, based on moles, uh, so moles of a compound per uh, liter of uh, fluid. And so uh, the kind of things that we'll be interested in is, uh, is the, the, how the mass changes, how it's produced, and uh, how it's decaying. Okay, so those are chemical reactions, biological reactions. Uh, here we're going to treat biological entities at, kind of instead of mass. So we'll have concentration uh, as, say, the number of, of biological entities per volume, um, or, the, or, or we may take the mass of the entities per volume. So we can describe a concentration as, or to describe a population uh, as a concentration. So that'll be a convenient way to think about it. And we'll be interested in the population dynamics, how the population grows and how it declines, decreases. And there'll be various applications for this pertaining to ecosystems. Um, okay, so Here's what we're going to do. I want to talk a little bit about the basic uh, approach, um, put it in context of uh, our, our overall conservation equations, and then look at some, uh, some basic kind of reactions, and then make it a little more complicated with some decay chains where we've got uh, multiple coupled reactions. And then we'll end up looking at some uh, of these ecological uh, population dynamics examples. So this is the, 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 the basic approach that we've been using for our examples, um, where we say that uh, for, for everything we're doing, this will, be a, this will apply a lot. The divergence of the flux times the rate of change of our uh, compound with time, the rate of change of storage, and that equals some kind of source. Um, so, for this application, if we have a control volume, the conceptual model is that um, for, for what we're interested in, we have a, a reaction going on in here inside of the control volume, and that's pretty much it. Um, the flows across the boundary that we've been looking at in the past. Um, we're going to just ignore for now, okay? So we'll get to that stuff, but we're going to say that our control volume now has a just impermeable side. So we're really only interested in what's going on inside of it, all right? So that's our, our concept. Now, the, um, the thing that's conserved here, uh, we'll take as an example the the dissolved mass in water. So for, uh, for the chemical reactions, when we get started, we'll just look at homogeneous reactions that are taking place in, in water. So the, the thing that's conserved will be uh, just mass uh, dissolved. So I called it ms here. And so our little c, the way the, the approach that we're taking is that little c is 
going to be the thing that's conserved per unit volume. So it's that per unit volume. And just to keep things simple, this will be a uh, control volume will be just filled with, with fluid. Um, so we've got, we've got mass dissolved in the fluid per unit volume of the fluid. So that's just uh, kind of our standard approach for describing aqueous concentration. So I'm going to, for this example, I'm going to use big C for concentration. And so little c will equal big C for this application. Easy to keep track of. OK, so then we can go and look at these individual terms. Um, let's, the storage term here, that guy, the rate of change of little c is just the rate of change of big C. So not, not too earth-shaking there. Um, and so that's this term. The divergence of the flux, well, for this example, the flux is equal to 0. So um, the, the, the divergence of the flux is equal to 0, too. So that's, um, that's pretty, pretty simple. Um, and the last term, the source term, so the source is going to be the, the mass that's produced um, by the reaction. So um, we'll just have the, the, the S, which is our generic source term, is going to be equal to R, which is our reaction rate. And we can do the units here. Um, the units of this thing has, have got to be mass of our dissolved compound per volume per time. Okay, so we have a reaction rate that has, oops, that has these, these units. Okay, so then uh, the, we can substitute in back here that goes and uh, we end up with just this big C. Okay. So I don't know, this is, on one hand, this is not really too earth-shaking, but the, 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 it's the, the rate of change of storage um, is equal to the reaction rate. So, I mean, that seems pretty obvious, but I think it's worthwhile doing this because we're starting, we're starting with this guy for everything. And so what I'm trying to do here is allow us to go back to this and use this for more complicated processes that we're interested in, but we're going to take care of the reactions here using this framework. Um, so we'll be able to use them later on. Okay. So now we want to go and, and look at this uh, in a little bit more detail, and we'll develop some, uh, some terminology. So I'm going to start off here with, uh, um, with just a basic... Uh, reaction and so we've got these uh, these the compounds A and B are, are reactants that uh, go do some kind of reaction and produce uh, product P and so the specifics of what this is uh, don't really matter what these compounds are uh, but um, we'll just use this in, in kind of a generic way Okay, so that's, uh, that's the reaction, this example reaction that we'll, uh, that, that, that we'll look at. And, and what we're interested in is how fast does this reaction take place. So just a review, um, you know, we've got this, these chemicals that are dissolved in water. Um, and the, this term A, little a, uh, sub P, is the activity of, uh, of compound P. And that's going to equal, uh, I'll put in square brackets, that's the molar concentration uh, of P, uh, which is what we were looking at previously, moles per volume. And uh, then we, we multiply that by this uh, activity coefficient for P. Okay. So um, all of the, the things that we're going to be 
working on will be done, will be expressed in terms of activity. Um, but what we're going to be measuring is going to be the uh, P, or it's going to be the, um, this guy here, the, the molar concentration. So what we'll assume for the examples here is this guy, this activity coefficient. We're just going to say that for our examples here, that equals 1. So when we develop stuff for activity, it'll also apply for concentration. We can go back and include uh, this guy explicitly, this activity coefficient, and carry it on through. Um, uh, but uh, we'll, we're not going to do that right now. Okay, so what we have then for this reaction, um, we can express this. Let's see, one way to write this guy is like this. So, so this reaction is A plus B. There's two of B's, so we'll just write it like that. And then it goes to three P's, three products. So we can write this as a reaction quotient, Q. Uh, and this is going to be the ratio of the activities of the products divided by the reactivities of the reactants. So it's going to be like this. So A, P. A, P, A, P, divided by A, the activities of the reactants, okay? So that's the, um, that's the reaction quotient or the ion activity product, okay? So this guy, though, I think, I think you can see this is going to be just cubed. And this is A to the first power, and that's A squared. Okay, so that's a, uh, another way to, to write this. And we could also write it like this. So we can think of this as a formula. Uh, and we just write these with negative, okay? So the ion activity product we could also write like that. Um, and what, what we see here is that this, this guy right there is just the stoichiometric coefficient in the, in, in the chemical reaction. Okay, um, so so this guy is, this, this guy Q, is going to, this describes how the reaction has, has proceeded. When we start off, we, we might just have, might just mix together some of this stuff, and we have no P. So initially, Q is zero. And then we'll produce P, and we'll consume A and B. And eventually, uh, so Q then increases. But then this will be, this is the equilibrium reaction, this will go to some kind of uh, a, a balance so that, the, that, that these guys, the, the, the ratio of the products, the reactants equals some kind of proportion that will occur when we have, uh, have equilibrium. Okay. So um, another thing that we'll want to do is develop a, a, a bit of a, um, of a more compact notion, or more, no, more compact notation. Um, and so I'm going to write this out like this. Um, And yeah, actually, so this would be P, A, B. And so now I'm going to write this a little bit differently. I'm going to write it as OK, so I've replaced the P, A, and the B with the 1, 2, and 3. OK, and I'm going to do that just because I want to use a compact notation where everything is going to be numbers. Okay. So now this form here is 
is written in, in shorthand like this. And this capital Pi is the product symbol. So it means uh, multiply this stuff together. I mean, you, you know the summation symbol. It says add these things together like this. This says multiply them together. So what we do is we, we go from i equals 1 to 3, so the three components, and we have uh, a1, a2, and a3 for the three components, and then we've got this exponent, and this exponent vi is going to be, um, it looks like it's, it's, it's a vector that looks like that. Okay. So that's, um, that's one way of, of writing it. Uh, and then we can we could write this. Another approach would be like this. Um, so that's basically shorthand for this. I'm going to also write, it, write shorthand for that. And so that's going to be Q. And it's uh, this pi. I've mean, I got to get a little bit of. A little more room there. So that's going to be pi, and this will be for uh, Okay. So, oh, I got that. I got that backwards. So let's let's see. Let's get this right. So the products, yeah, products go on top. So this one would be that, and yeah, this is going to be for v greater than zero, and. This is less than zero, and that's negative. OK? So we define v, this v vector, like that. But if we write it here as a ratio, let me, let me go and try to clarify that a little bit. So we're summing, summing on i, and we're using the vi greater than zero. and then in the denominator, we're using the vi's less than zero, and we're changing the sign. OK. So this, then, is a way of writing that. The vi's are less than zero for the, um, the reactants. And I've got that negative sign in there because when you write it as a ratio, the exponents there, those exponents are positive. They become negative here when I write them all, all together in this format. Okay? So these, this and this are equivalent. See how that works? So we have the, this is the products here, and this is the reactants. So for the reactants, the vi is less than zero, but we want to have the exponents when we're writing it out be negative here. Okay? So um, that's for the reaction quotient. And then when this reaches equilibrium, um, we have.
So the equilibrium constant is just written that way. So these are now the activities um, at equilibrium. OK? So this is, I, mean, I think it's pretty straightforward in this form. And then you just have to, have to kind of translate it or just kind of uh, recognize this more compact form that's used to express these, uh, these different uh, reactions. OK, so now with that format in mind, we're going to go and, um, and, and expand this out a little bit. And we'll introduce a concept where uh, the, what, we're, what we're after is understanding the reaction rate of this, how, how fast it goes. Uh, and we're going to say that, the, that, that this rate, that the, the overall rate, will be equal to the, the forward rate uh, minus the backward rate. Okay, so that'll be, uh, that'll be one thing. And the, we'll also say that the forward rate um, is proportional to the activities of the reactants. So the activities of the things that we have to cause the reaction, uh, their activity is going to be uh, proportional to the forward reaction. And so the forward reaction rate, uh, or plus, uh, it's going to be, for our, our example here, that it'll be the activity of A uh, and activity of B squared. And the forward, forward reaction is proportional to that. And that's going to be equal to this using our compact notation. OK, because remember the way that we had it defined, the reactants are negative. So we're just going to be, these guys are, have, have negative, uh, negative stoichiometric coefficients there in this format, OK? So we're only going to be including them uh, in our forward reaction expression. And this is just kind of our, our conceptual model, that the forward, forward reaction rate goes like that. Now, the backward reaction rate, we're going to use the same, uh, same approach, but we're going to just, I mean, just assume that the reaction is going that way. I guess we could, we could write it with the 3P on the other side. But for the backward reaction, the, the 3P is the, is the reaction, or is the, those are the um, reactants. So the backward reaction is like that. And so there's a, a proportionality, of the reaction rate constant. And then uh, conceptually then, we're just going to take the difference between these two. So we will, um, the overall reaction is this. OK, so that's our conceptual model. Um, now, when equilibrium occurs, the reaction rate goes to 0. And so 
at that point, the forward and backward reaction rates are equal. So we can figure out what, uh, what's happening there. The reaction rate is, is zero, so we can say like this, at, at equilibrium, R is equal to zero. And so when R is equal to zero, that is equal to that. So at equilibrium, we're going to have Okay. All right. Well, so now what we do is we'll divide. We're going to divide divide through by KB, and we're going to just kind of rearrange this. So the KB comes over here. Uh, sorry, that should be should be K. Oops. This this R should be KF. The forward reaction rate. Okay. So this guy comes over here, and this goes over here. So I'll end up with this. Okay, and that, oh, oh, I'm sorry, and this is, these are uh, at equilibrium. And that's the equilibrium constant. Okay, we had that up here. So this is equal to, to that, so there's the equilibrium constant. Okay, so what we get then is the equilibrium constant is equal to the ratio of these, these reaction rates. Okay? All right, so um, now I'm kind of, let's see, I'm divide that off. Now what I'm going to do is come back to here and we're just going to do a little bit of algebra. Okay? So what I'm going to do is factor out this. And so when I do that, I'm going to, I'm going to say this thing here equals uh, let, let, let me just call this um, like alpha. So this whole thing this whole thing equals alpha. So I can, I can just factor out alpha and call it 1 minus, let's call that beta, beta over alpha. Okay? Right, so if, if this is alpha minus beta, then we can, we can say this thing equals that. So that's what I've done here. If you have these, if you have the, the uh, PowerPoint, um, this guy doing this kind of factoring gives me that. Okay? If I multiply through, then this is the same as that right there. So they would just cancel out and give me the original expression back. Okay? All right. So this is all some gyrations, but, but what we need to do now is, this is kind of the important part. 
right here, that's what we call Q, the reaction quotient. And it's describing the, how far along the reaction is. And this stuff here, that's 1 over K. And it's describing the proportion of the reactions at equilibrium. So we have this. So just this term here, less than zero. And this is one minus Q over K. Okay? All right, so this is describing then uh, our reaction kinetics, and it's done in a fairly general way. Um, this, is, this we can build up for any reaction we want. We started with this uh, A plus B going to P reaction, but we could, we could do this in a general, a general way. The, the equilibrium constant, um, there are a variety of ways of, of, of coming up with this. But this is really something that's describing the thermodynamics of the, the reaction. What happens is that um, as the reaction, when the reaction, well, when the reaction is far from equilibrium, then Q is small relative to, to K. Um, this number here is small, and this whole thing is essentially equal to 1. But then as the reaction proceeds, Q approaches K, and it equals K at equilibrium. And so this term here um, goes to zero when Q goes to K. So this goes to zero, and essentially this is what stops the reaction when it goes to equilibrium. So far from equilibrium, uh, this is equal to this is equal to zero. This whole thing is equal to one. And far from equilibrium, you have that uh, really being the controlling term. And then as you get closer to equilibrium, uh, this, this basically brings everything to zero. Okay? So the, the beauty of it is that it, it, it works. Um, it, it gives us a way to describe how the reaction proceeds when it's far from equilibrium and things are are perhaps moving fairly quickly, but then it, it allows us to describe the, the reaction going to equilibrium and reaching the right stoichiometry for the reaction. Okay, so this is a, a nice general way of describing, uh, at, at, least, at least as a first cut, the kinetics of the, these, uh, of like a homogeneous uh, reaction may have have applications broader than that, uh, but for these simple reversible um, reactions, uh, this then becomes a, a good starting point. Okay, so here's how we might implement this. Um, this reaction rate, this will give us, uh, for our reaction here, um, well, it, in general, we're going to go and calculate this reaction rate, and we have these various different constituents, we'll use this term R that we calculate like that, and we're going to want to track the, the concentrations of three constituents for this example, right, A, B, and P. So we calculate R, come up with R here, and then the, uh, the kinetics, the rate expression for each individual component you get um, from R, and then we also have to use this uh, the stoichiometry coefficient VI. So let's see how that's going to work for our example here. Um, we go through, do, the, do this calculation, and uh, A, in this case, A is being consumed by this reaction. So uh, we go and calculate R. Uh, VI for A is minus 1, so the kinetic expression for A is 
is like this. It's a negative um, because A is being consumed. And, uh, and then for B, we also have this kinetic expression. And it, we have this coefficient. This is the, the kinetic or the stoichiometry coefficient for B. We, you can see up here, though, that um, for each mole of A that's consumed, two moles of B are going to be consumed. So the reaction for B is going to be faster than A. I think that just follows kind of intuitively. And then, it, then, then we can confirm here that it's working that way. And similarly, for each mole of A that's consumed, we have three moles of P that's produced. So the reaction rate for P has a different sign than A. It's positive. Um, and there's the there's the, the, the stoichiometry term, OK? So this allows us to generalize to all the different components in the reaction. All right, so very, very nice. We have, have a, a, a way to proceed, um, starting with that general uh, equation. So now what I've done here is to try this out. Um, th this, I don't know, you guys probably have all been exposed to some kinetics. Um, and th this is usually not what you see. This is, this is a lot more cryptic looking than what you usually see. Um, and so what I want to do is show you to hopefully get you a little bit more comfortable with thinking about it like this, show you how this applies to some of the things, some of the cases that you, uh, that, that you probably have seen. So let's just take a simple reaction where you, we've got A um, go, uh, undergoing some reaction and producing uh, products and let's just call that uh, call that some product P. Okay, so here's the reaction, um, and we're going to be interested in what's happening with this far from equilibrium. So when when Q is small, when things are just really starting out, so we have no products at all to start with, um, and then uh, so so what this gives us here uh, is is that just just the KF. And this product thing here, it, it just is, there's only one thing, the A, so uh, it just gives us the, it would give us actually the, the activity of A, but we're going to say then the activity uh, coefficient is equal to 1. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what we get. And then um, we've got the, the, uh, this, this term here. Uh, the stoichiometry coefficient in this is minus one, so we get we get this for the rate expression. I don't know what that stuff is. Just cross that out. So here it is. That's what we get from our general expression, and we see that that um, the the rate of degradation of a uh, rate of change of A is proportional to the concentration of A. It's negative, so A is going away. Um, this is a first order degradation reaction. The, the rate is proportional to the to a to the first power. Okay, so this is, this is probably the most common type of kinetics. Um, we also uh, apply the approach that we saw on the previous slide and get a rate expression for p. Uh, it's going to be uh, equal to a, but the sign is different, so we get uh, we get that. So the the um, uh, degradation of p is equal to the uh, the, the rate of production of P is equal to the rate at which A is consumed. So this uh, first order uh, set of expressions, you can solve this uh, analytically using a, um, an initial condition that uh, A at time zero is equal to A zero uh, and B at time zero is equal to zero. And if you do that, you get a um, uh, you get an analytical expression where the concentration of A just decreases as a negative exponential, um, and B increases as one minus a negative exponential. And so here, are plots of of that. There's the that would be uh, A, and that would be uh, B. Okay, so those are um, examples of first order reactions. Um, uh, here's a, another type of reaction where uh, two moles of A is going to say one mole of, uh, a, of a product, and uh, we use our general equation here, uh, and we get, we get this, the stoichiometry uh, gives us this squared term, and so the reaction rate ends up being 
proportional to uh, a squared, uh, and a and we, we again have that negative term for degradation of a. Um, the reaction uh, rate of p. Um, so p is so two moles of a are, are consumed and for to produce one mole of p. So the reaction rate of p p is p is positive reaction rate, but it's half of the rate of A because of the stoichiometry. So, uh, so we, get, we get that term there. Okay, so this is called the second order reaction because the reaction rate in A is proportional to A to the squared. Um, okay. Um, so this, yeah, we have gen, then a, this kind of general class of of reactions that are these basic reactions far from equilibrium. And the way that, that we're always going to describe these kinetics is with a rate of change of uh, concentration or, or potentially as an activity, but um, writing it here as a, as a rate of change of a concentration, um, we've got zero first, second, and uh, mixed second order reactions where the rate of change is proportional to uh, the concentration to, to some power. So for zero, it's to zero power, which is just uh, um, one, and, and we get then a constant rate of change, and the, these examples we just saw, and we might have something like this where we've got uh, two reactants, uh, and they're, they're both important, and so we have, we have something like that which might might be viewed as a mixed second order reaction. So all of these just follow directly from that general uh, expression that we saw. Um, one thing that's done in some cases is to take reactions that are like this, that are, um, that are, that are, that are second order and make them into first order. Uh, and so one of the ways that you could do this well, kind of one of the conceptual approaches is to say, well, um, the, when we write out the reaction, we get this. We get these two terms because A and B are, are both over here as reactants. But in this case, um, A is, is really abundant. And so we might have a lot of A, and we put in B, and, and then the reaction goes because the B is there. And there's plenty of A, but B is really the the limiting case. And so if that's, if that's the way that it's working, uh, then we can think of A, the concentration of A, as equal to the initial concentration minus uh, the whatever is produced. Okay? So that's just kind of a basic, basic balance. But if there's lots of A and just a small amount of P, then uh, this is going to be uh, approximately equal to just A0. So if this is really big compared to that, then we could just approximate it like that. And, and really the concentration of A isn't really, it's not really changing uh, to any appreciable degree. But, but B is because we just have a small amount of B. So uh, B is going to be um, going to be equal to the initial amount of B minus how, wh whatever we've produced. Um, and so if we take these and substitute them back in, so we take, take in, instead of A, now we put in A0, and B is, B, B is now um, B0 minus P, then this guy, which we get from our original equation, becomes this. And this now says that P, the rate of change of P is just proportional to to p to the first power, so this ends up becoming kind of a transformation to get uh, to, to get into a, a, a first order uh, equation. Okay, so that'll be convenient for some uh, some applications. Um, so we also want to check this, and uh, well, reversible reactions will be an important uh, thing that we'll want to include. Um, when I translate this, this should be a, should be an arrow that goes back and forth. Um, so we got a forward reaction and a, a forward and backwards reaction, 
And so the, the way that we can think about this is that um, A, is, A is being degraded uh, to B. So there's a forward reaction that causes A to be consumed and produce B. But there's a back reaction that causes A to be produced by the consumption of B. Okay, so that's the, that's the back reaction. So here's forward and here's backwards. This is being uh, removed because it's negative, and then the back reaction is consuming B and, and producing A. And so then the, the net is that we've got, um, we add them together. So the net change, the rate of change of A is just the, the consumption uh, or the, the, the reaction that, that consumes A and the reaction that, that produces it. Um, and uh, we can get then from the stoichiometry that uh, the, the, the rate of change of B is just equal to the negative of, of A. So for a reversible reaction, oh, well, and we substitute in and we get that. So for a reversible reaction, we get the two components um, with uh, reactions that are, uh, that, are, that are like this. Just the, the difference between the forward and the, the back reactions. So this is also something that we can solve analytically. Um, and you can, you can set these equal to one another and get an equilibrium concentration. And so here's a plot of, of what that looks like. And so instead of decreasing to zero, the, um, this, this compound A is decreasing and going to this equilibrium concentration. Okay? So we can, we can solve that um, and get an analytical expression. And that'll be nice because one of the things that we'll do when we first start simulating this is put in these, these basic kinetic expressions and then run it and we've got analytical expressions for, for these simple cases and so we'll use that to, to validate how this is all, all working. Okay, so this simple reversible reaction, um, I think it's, it's useful just to check, go back to our um, our general expression and just make sure that if we start here we can get our reversible reaction. Um, so if we say that, um, that the rate of change of A is equal to, to this, uh, the reaction quotient is the uh, ratio of the concentration of the, um, of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. And so when we're applying this, this guy here, that's something we'll be simulating the concentrations of, of both A and B, or if it's a more complicated reaction, we'll be simulating the concentrations of all of the components. And so we'll simply build up uh, this reaction quotient, we'll calculate it as we go. It's just this, it's just going to be this ratio. Okay, but for our purposes here, we take Q and substitute it in. And if we do that, then, um, well, we substitute it in and we multiply Kf through. So, so it's Kfa when we take that multiplied by 1, and then Kfa times Q. Q is B over A, so the A's cancel. And we get that. And then um, we just say that, that Kb is, I mean, it's, it's apparent here that Kb is equal to the forward reaction divided by the equilibrium constant. Okay, so we can, we can start with our general expression and we get this uh, reversible reaction out of it. So that's, that's a good, good check to make sure that it, it's just these basic reactions that we're, um, that we're going to want to include can, can fall out of this, this general approach. <coughs> Okay, so in a lot of cases, we'll have multiple reactions that we want to include. And this gives us a nice way to, to think about getting started. I guess one thing I should point out is that this, this, is, this is a good way to get started, but there, there are a lot of things that can go on to cause things to, uh, to be a bit different. So chemical reactions are pretty complicated. And one thing, for example, is uh, these, these coefficients right here, 
they're not necessarily always the stoichiometric coefficients. That there are cases when, uh, when, when they're not, and that has to come out of experiments. So this gives us a, a, a place to start, um, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to want to have experiments to, to verify this. Okay. So what we were just looking at is one reaction. What we have, though, is um, a, a variety of scenarios where we have multiple reactions going on. One case of multiple reactions is where we have decay chains. And there you have one compound that decays or degrades into another compound, and then that compound in turn degrades into another compound and, and so on. And so uh, radioactive decay is, I think, a pretty well-known one. Here's, here's, you guys recognize that? Fukushima, Fukushima. yeah. So I thought that was a nice <laughs> picture for, for radioactive decay. Why, why you should be interested in, in radioactive decay. Um, and so, yeah, here's the, this degradation reaction. We start with some uranium and go to thorium and then go on down here. There's radium and, and there's all these other things that, are, that you get. Down here, here's lead. Um, and so this is an example of a, of a decay chain. Um, over here on this side, um, this kind of reaction happens in a variety of different scenarios. So this is an example of, um, uh, of an organic uh, decay chain. And uh, so this is uh, perchloroethylene, trichloroethylene, dichloro, vinyl chloride, and ethylene. So what's going on here is you have, uh, um, you got a molecule like this, two carbons, and four chlorines, and that's that's this guy, and then there's a reaction that takes place where um, this bond is broken, and the chlorine heads out, and it is replaced by hydrogen. So now we have three chlorines, and that's this, trichloroethylene. Uh, and then this happens again, and you have one of these, uh, another chlorine cleaved off, replaced with hydrogen, and uh, that's then two chlorines, dichloroethylene, and so on. You cut off another one, that's, that's vinyl chloride, and then you cut off all of them and replace them with hydrogen, and that's ethylene. Okay, so um, this is the kind of uh, concentration as a function of time that you see for uh, these kinds of decay reactions. Uh, here's, uh, for example, if we were to start with a solution that just had uh, PCE in it and none of the other uh, daughter compounds are present, so it decays like I show here. Um, and, and gets to be a fairly small concentration after 100 units of time. What happens, though, is that this is de as this is degrading, it's producing uh, this uh, daughter compound. So the red there would be uh, TCE. So TCE gets produced, and that causes the concentration to increase. But as it's being produced, then it's also degrading uh, to, to this guy. So this red curve is really what we get from, from this happening, the production of TC by degradation of PC, and the degradation of TC by, uh, to DC. Okay, so you can see what happens is initially uh, this is the most important one. It's, it's producing TC, uh, but then here it's degrading it, and the concentration is, is dropping off. And so you reach a peak right here at some time uh, after the, the whole thing has started. And it, that, will, that time depends on these uh, relative reaction rates. And of course, as TCE is degrading, uh, DCE, uh, the next one in the chain, is being produced. And it also degrades. 
Uh, and so there's DC. Uh, and it's degrading and, and coming up and uh, in, in producing uh, VC. Um, and then <coughs> I think the way I set this up, this example, uh, just, just it doesn't include this reaction. So what happens then is, is this green line eventually goes up and stabilizes out. And it, it, it basically this is the final concentration where everything is degraded to the, the last compound. Okay, so this set of curves is what you kind of expect for, for this kind of uh, decay chain type, uh, type of process. Okay, so here's how we're going to, to implement that. So conceptually, we've got uh, some things degrading and some things being produced, and sometimes it happens uh, both simultaneously. So, um, if we have a decay chain like this, um, and well, actually, by the way, here's, here's some experimental data um, for PCE, TCE, this, this degradation um, sequence. And you can see the, 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 the points are, um, are the data, and then the lines are kind of best fit. <coughs> and you can see that it looks very much like the, the concept that we had on the previous page. All right, so here's, here's how we're going to set this up. Conceptually, um, we start with A, and it's going to degrade to B, but that's all that A will do. So A only has the option of, of degrading, so we just use that kinetics. Um, and, and we saw just in in general, if, it, if A is going to, to B, that we expect that to be, uh, to be first order. If, if that's the, the, the reaction, just one mole of A going to product of, of B. Um, and then B, though, it's being produced by degradation of A. So here's the, here's the production of B by degrading A, and here's the de degradation of B uh, to, to give us C. Okay, so it's negative, it's also first order. And then C, it's going to be produced by the degradation of B, so the degradation of B is shown here, and so there's the the degradation of B that produces C, and then C itself also will degrade um, at a rate that's proportional to the concentration of, of C. Okay, so we have first order degradation of C, uh, and, uh, and then uh, production of C as a result of degradation of B. And then here, the, the last one in the chain, uh, D is just produced by the degradation of C, and D is stable. Okay, so that's how we would set up this, uh, this, this decay chain that gives us this, uh, this sequence of, um, of different reactions. Okay, so those are some chemical application. We also might want to apply this to um, the populations and look at ecosystem uh, responses. And there are a couple of, uh, of potential applications. Um, <coughs> this one, uh, this is the, the Verhulst uh, equation or logistic equation, and this uh, describes um, population dynamics, where we've got uh, growth and decline of, uh, of populations. Uh, and let's take a look. This is this is what it it says. So we've got the rate of change of the population. Um, this is going to be growth, and this is going to be uh, going to be decay. Okay, so um, what happens then is that w w if if the concentration starts out small uh, and increases, then um, if you start if you have a small number and square it, then then the square is smaller than the the number that you start with. So 
uh, initially when the concentration is small, this is uh, this is this is small and uh, this is bigger. And so when it's small, it's really dominated by that just first order growth. And then and then if it's just as allowed to do this, what happens is 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 as the concentration gets bigger. Um, this becomes more important, and eventually, um, eventually these two terms become equal, and the rate of change uh, is is equal to zero. Okay, so you start at zero concentration and let it grow. This just goes up and and equilibrates. But if you if you have something happening where the population can can explode and you get get a big concentration, then what happens is like like overpopulation, say. Uh, then then this guy this guy grows and this this becomes bigger than that. So uh, if the system is allowed to to go beyond equilibrium, then this brings it back and essentially causes a die off. Um, and so that that is a, a, a fairly simple way of Describing some population dynamics, um, where you would have, say, the, um, the 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 growth limited by a food supply, um, spread of disease actually is also described using this kind of uh, kind of an approach. Okay. Um, another thing that we would be interested in is looking at uh, the population dynamics of microbes. <clears throat> Here's some nice pictures. Um, I just recently saw pictures like this where the microbes are imaged and given nice colors. And so this is, I guess, the microbes in your intestines. And here's some other ones. They're streptococcus. And so pretty cool. Um, and so we're interested in understanding the, the dynamics of those guys as a population. So if we think of a growth reaction for something like this, it's going to be pretty complicated. I mean, we're going to have start off with some microbes, some biomass. We've got some kind of source of carbon and energy, um, maybe some nutrients, nitrogen, some other, other nutrients, an electron acceptor. And then all of that stuff goes to um, ultimately more biomass. Right, so for, for growing microbes, you start off with some microbes and they consume some stuff um, and then they produce more microbes. Uh, and then there also, there also will be things left over, waste products and uh, re the reduced electron acceptor and some, some other stuff. Okay, so if you look at it in detail, this is a very complicated reaction. Um, but what's often done is to say, well, I'm going to simplify this down, and I'm going to say that we start with some, some biomass, and we're going to have some kind of substrate. And, and this will be the, the most important ingredient here. Um, and so that, those two will be used to make some more biomass. <clears throat> okay, so um, at least as a first cut, we might think of, think of this complicated thing just like that. And, and if that's the case, then what happens is when you conduct experiments that uh, if you provide plenty of, of substrate, plenty of food, then you see that the rate of change of the concentration, the concentration starting out low, say, and the rate of change is, is just proportional to the, the, the concentration of the, the microbes. But um, if, if you remove the food and you have just a very limited amount of food, um, then I mean, you, you might think of this as, um, we th if we think of this using our previous approach, right, where uh, we had a rate of change equal to what we had before was is a constant times the, the, the reactants, uh, and then we had this the, this function that was the, well, before we had this thing, it was, it's called an affinity function, like that. So if we forget about this part and say, well, 
what we were seeing is that the rate of change is, is a, it's a constant times the, the reactance. And if this is our simple concept, then we, we could say, well, okay, th this is probably what we would expect to happen, that, that the, the, the rate of growth, it depends on the microbes, but it also depends on the, the substrate. And if substrate is limiting, you know, if we, if we cut this back, then we're going to cut back the growth. Okay, so I think that's a simple concept. And so what you want to do then is to have an expression that, um, that allows you to, to have this kind of behavior. So the, the way that that's done is to, uh, the typical approach is to use this equation here. This is the Monod equation. And so we, we have the rate of change is equal to this guy. So this, this kind of looks like first order growth. And then we've got this other term here. Um, that, that accounts for the role of the, the, the substrate. OK, so what will happen when S is, um, when the substrate is really common, so the concentration is really large, and when the concentration is really large, then, these, the, then if, the, if this concentration is bigger, much bigger than that, then the denominator is essentially just S sub S, and, and, and this cancels. Um, so th this thing, this thing equals one when uh, when S is large. So when the substrate is common, um, this is one, and we get this first order growth. Now when when S is really small, then um, when S is really small compared to K two, then the denominator essentially becomes K two. And, and, and this just drops out. So for, for a small, for small amounts of S, then you have K1, K2 is there. And you have that, the C there, and this, this guy, this SS. OK, so you have this behavior for a small S where the kinetics are limited by the, by the concentration of, of S. But the beauty of this equation is that it handles the, uh, yeah, this one here, uh, is that it handles the, the, the intermediate cases. It has, it has right end member, end member behavior and handles the intermediate cases as well. Um, okay, so um, we also then, uh, well, so basically what this means is that if we're going to do that, then we need to keep track of of the substrate, because that, I mean, that could be changing. And if it does, if the microbes eat all of the, the substrate, then um, that's going to affect the microbial growth. Um, so what we say is that um, the, the, the substrate, the, the rate of change of substrate is going to be, um, well, we can, we can write, we can write, yeah, I have a typo here, but you can write it uh, that the rate of change of the substrate uh, looks like this. So I mean, if we have the chain rule, those would cancel, and uh, we get the um, we we get this back. I guess we have that like so. Okay, and then what we're going to do is say this equals it should be an equal sign there. So. Um, this is the rate of change of the, the, the microbial population, and we have this 1 over y term, which we recognize as that. So the change of the substrate per change in, uh, in this, this says the change in substrate per change in concentration. So how much, um, basically, basically how much microbial mass is produced per unit of substrate or food or compound that's consumed. Okay, so then what that allows us to do is write the, the kinetics for the substrate, um, and it's going to be equal to the, the substrate goes away when the, when the concentration of, um, uh, of the microbes increases, so the sign changes, and we've got this yield term here. 
But other than that, this stuff here is the same as, as, the, as that. Okay, so, so we've got these two uh, kinetics expressions that are coupled together for the growth of the microbes and the, the uh, consumption of this um, substrate that's going to be important for the, the growth. Okay, so that'll handle some aspects of the microbial population, but uh, we also may want to include um, the death of the microbes. We may want to kill them um, for some applications, right? I mean, uh, microbes could be a problem. We may, we may want to encourage them to grow, but they may be dying anyway. Um, and so we want to include the, the death of the, the microbes as part of this. Well, um, we, can, we could use an expression like this and say, well, the rate of, of uh, the, the death rate, the rate at which the concentration changes, uh, is going to be equal to the, um, a, a model for the death rate is that, the, that it equals, uh, that, it's, that it's first order, that the, the rate of change of the concentration depends on the concentration itself. Now, there may be other ways to conceptualize the, the death rate, but this is, uh, this is one way that, it, that it's done, and I think that this makes sense as a way to include it. So here you go. Um, we can then say that our, our microbial population is going to grow here by consuming substrate and, and, and doing its thing, but it also will die at, at some rate. So as the concentration increases, as the population increases, then the death rate also uh, increases. And so if we have something like this, this will give us a, this will give us, end up giving us a stable population where, where this term equals that term. Um, and then we also have to factor into this the consumption of the substrate um, using the approach that we had before. We just change, take this, change the sign, and divide by the yield. And so that gives us a, a simple approach for coming up with substrate consumption. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a way we can, uh, can, can include those different effects. Here's kind of a nice um, application, and, and this will be, I think, a good, a good place to close. So uh, if you look at um, some experiments that have been, been done on microbial um, populations, you get a curve that looks like this the microbial population uh, increases, kind of hits a stationary phase, and then uh, dies off. So I tried this out using these kinetics here. Um, and here's what you get. This is, this is the substrate. Uh, and then this is the microbial population growing. And if there's no deaths, then what happens is the microbial population grows and reaches this kind of stable number, and then it just stops. If you put in death as a first order process, then it looks like that. It grows, and then, and then eventually they just they, they die off. I mean, you can see what happens. They consume all of the, all of the substrate. There's no more food. They're on, they're on the desert island, and they, they eat all their food, and then eventually they just die out, OK? So that's what's going on there. And then I wanted to try to reproduce this, and this doesn't look quite the same. So what I did was I said, okay, the death rate is going gonna, is gonna to be zero at first, and then it's going to kick in at a certain time. So, it'll, it'll, so as the population is growing, uh, essentially we can have, have growth according to this curve. But then, at some point, we start to have this, uh, this, this, uh, th this process. And when you do that, you can see that this is where the, the death starts occurring, and you get a population uh, curve that looks kind of like that, which is, which is kind of like what they were describing in the experiments. Okay, so for homework, you'll be trying out various different examples, um, like what we just, uh, just saw, and they're fairly simple, but um, I think it's good to, to get started with some, some simple examples and, and work it up to, to be more, more complicated. All right, so good luck, and I'll see you on Tuesday.